here because there was a website about Sylvia Pankhurst and it's in the process of being reviewed and this is a learning session at the High School for Girls and we are discussing her today. My name is Jolie and I'm Soraya and we're sixth formers at Woodford County High School. Today we're going to be interviewing Sylvia Ailing for a review of the Sylvia Pankhurst website. What sparked your interest in Sylvia Pankhurst? Well I moved to Woodford in the 1960s and I met a local resident who told me that Sylvia Pankhurst had lived here for 32 years. I couldn't believe it, to be frank. Oh yes, he said. She lived in Chartres Road, which isn't far from where I used to push my daughter with her pram to the shops. Anyway, I must have looked quizzically at him. So he said, oh yes, if you go to the high road, Woodford Green, you will find there is an anti-air war memorial that she left there. And I was even more intrigued. And for many years, I focused on that monument, especially during the Cold War, because of its nature. So what can you tell us about this monument? Well, it was set up in 1935 because what had happened was there was an invasion of Ethiopia. It was also bombed with mustard gas. She was greatly concerned having known about bombing planes because of her experience in the East End of London in the Great War, 1418. So, in fact, she had a sculptor called Eric Benko design it. It's actually a stone bomb on top of a stone plinth. And the inscription's particularly interesting. It says, its tone is ironic, I might say, to those who, in 1932, refused to ban the use of bombing planes. Now, to Pankhurst, this was a great scandal. The League of Nations was set up in 1920, and their aims included that there would be no more war, that disarmament, disarmament would come about, and that the needs of the people would be recognized. This monument was used throughout the Cold War by a small peace group that I helped to support. And we were called the, the Wanstead and Woodford Women for Peace. And we took this banner wherever we could to various demonstrations throughout the war. But she was truly the inspiration behind what we did. So at some stage, we even organized a great peace walk from the monument to Wanstead Park. This was because the authorities had planned a, a center in case of nuclear war, this would be a center people would relate to. But I don't really think it would have withstood the force of an atomic bomb. But it was there, and we, we were pointing these things out in the press. Do you think Sylvia played in the Women's Social and Political Union as well? Yes, that's, that's a very interesting question, I have to say. Now then, Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst, in 1903, decided to move from Manchester, where the family was living, to London to fight a national campaign to bring about women's enfranchisement, votes for women. And the reason she did that was because the father, that's Richard Pankers, had died in 18, 1898, that's right. And on his death, the local group of a party called the Independent Labour Party, which had just been formed in the late 19th century, this party, this particular hall was to be called Pankhurst Hall. So Miss Pankhurst was a very gifted art student, a scholarship winning art student, and she designed what was going on to the walls. She painted um, quotations from the poet Shelley and also views of nature. And when the hall was opened, the women discovered that only men could use this hall. Mrs. Pankhurst got extremely exasperated and she called a meeting in her house and brought in other women who had actually joined, as she had, the Independent um, Labour Party and decided to fight a local campaign 
for women to be enfranchised. And at that point, Sylvia and Christabel were also members of the Independent Labour Party, which had been founded by a man called Kia Hardy, who became the leader of the Labour Party. Anyway, Sylvia and he had a very special relationship. When they came to London, Kia Hardy introduced the Pankers to two people who were very important in the movement, and they were Emmeline and Frederick Pethick Lawrence. Mrs. Pethick Lawrence was already involved in social work in the East End. Her husband was a lawyer with a particular interest in newspapers, and together they actually edited a newspaper, especially for suffragettes, called Votes for Women, which publicised the movement. So this was only part of this great publicity campaign, and there were lots of other things you could do, and they became very adept at using everything they could think of, including, it was Mrs. Mrs. Pethick Lawrence's idea, that was the actual colours of the movement, which was purple for loyalty, white for women, and green for hope. And the women always wore a sash, and you can imagine what a procession looked like when these women entirely dressed in white, wearing their sashes. They were virtually an army. It, was, it made an astonishing impression on the, on the public. Now, Frederick Pethick Lawrence helped to pay for a wonderful demonstration that took part, it it took part in Hyde Park, and that was on the 21st of June, 1908. Hundreds and hundreds of suffragettes were brought to the capital by railway, and thousands of people came. In fact, half a million people are thought to have attended this particular demonstration. This was all to impress the, the Liberal Prime Minister with the fact that this was an issue that had to be addressed. Something had to be done in Parliament, an act had to be passed to give women the vote. Mrs. Pankhurst was determined just to work to attract middle-class middle women. And this was because, if you think about it, women class, middle-class women actually had time and, and energy and resources to particularly help the movement forward. And the WSPU was in a hurry. They didn't have time to wait to attract as many women as possible. Poorer women, as, as Sylvia said herself, Behind every poorer, poor man, there is an even poorer woman. I want this poorer woman to stand up for her liberty. She stuck with that. And when she was canvassing at a by-election for all that was going on with the, with the ILP, she said, starvation looked at me with patient eyes. I knew then I could never go back to my work. And at that stage, she decided to set up her own particular branch, and she called it East London Federation of Suffragettes. And, but in fact, she had to do that because Mrs. Pankhurst refused to support her, and she had to set out on her own, and that's what she did. So you mentioned the East London Federation of Suffragettes, but what do you think Sylvia Pankhurst achieved with this um, federation? First to say she was very fortunate in so many different ways. This was a period of great unrest because of unemployment and low wages and poor living conditions and long hours of work. And Sylvia was interested in proving the entire lot of women, not just to give them the vote. That was just the first step. There were many other steps to be taken. So she welcomed the idea of going to the East End of London where there was a large working class. And these were people who were in, in, already engaged in, in strikes, people in the men and women, in, uh, some of them had joined the trade union movement. So this was perhaps a base for a mass approach to the whole problem of achieving the vote. But again, she was fortunate. One of her, her companion that she had made while she was at the the Royal Academy of Art. There was a sculptress, and her name was Nora Smythe. Nora Smythe was very fortunate. She was an heiress, and so there was money available to help Sylvia with all her various initiatives. Now, they rented a women's hall that was used as a social and cultural centre, 
and um, then there were various, I think there were about five different redundant shops in the, in the various boroughs and they were used as little headquarters for this particular group of women and, and they were doing as much social work as they could, so many issues to be addressed when unfortunately the Great War broke out and that changed everything. It was a complete catastrophe for so many people because men went to fight in the Great War and that left families behind, absolutely reliant on the state, which was not, it did, just didn't have an infrastructure to cope with such problems. So Sylvia fitted in with that and in effect set up a, a virtually a little mini welfare state. And to start with, within a week of the war breaking up, she had managed to get these various shops to be milk distribution centres. Then she took over a pub formerly called the Gunmaker's Arms, and it was called the Mother's Arms. There was a doctor in attendance once a week, a nurse in attendance daily, and a nursery run on Montessori principles, very advanced for their time. Then she set up a toy factory employing women, and they were paid the same wage as, as a basic wage paid to men during the war. And moreover, this particular factory had its very own creche, so women could come and bring their own work. So you can see that she was very much in advance of her time. And of course, she was hoping that the government would learn all these things from her. And of course, I'm afraid it would have meant for people taxes to be paid. But I'm sure you'd agree something very worthwhile. So I would say that that, was, that particular campaign was very successful. And certainly she deserves her place in history because of that. Well, clearly, she was a very impressive woman in terms of um, advocating for women's rights and protesting, especially with Ethiopia and the disarmament. But what do you think is especially significant about her in terms of historically? One of the most significant things that she did while she was working with her own East London Federation of Suffragettes was she actually published her own newspaper. So she was the first woman in British history to actually have a newspaper which she not only edited herself but actually ran it successfully for until 1924. Actually, that's right, and when she left, that was when she left and came to Woodford Green. Now, the marvellous thing about this paper was she felt that by going around and interviewing women, she could get them to talk about their lives and the great problems you can imagine of their life, housing, caring for children, and the lack of means. And so she was able to write into her paper a number of these interviews, which would be sold. They were sold in the street and also individual people went round selling them and also they were sold in stores. So she was spreading the word about the value of her particular movement. Sylvia moved to Woodford Green in 1924 when she wound up her newspaper and she lived first of all in South Woodford at a place called Frithman's, a very large house, and then she moved to, it, she called it Red Cottage which stood behind the monument. And she ran that as a tea shop, actually. It was just the place for a tea shop. It was at a bus terminus, so her friends could come up from the East End and visit her. And the bus men also had the benefit of a cup of tea. In 1925, Mussolini became dictator of Italy. Now, this was of great interest to the Pankhurst household because her partner, Silvio Corio, was actually an Italian refugee and, and also he was very much a, li a liberal socialist himself. And she knew because of his relationship with the Italians living in London, all the terrible things that were being done by fascists in Italy in, in the name of the people. Anyway, in 25, when after he came to power, two years after, in 1927, she gave birth to her only son, Richard, and her life changed forever. She found that she had a lot less time to spend on her campaigns because of the responsibility of bringing up her child. Now, one of the most significant things about her is that in 1930, she published a book called Save the Mothers 
it was an appeal for a national maternity service, which eventually, of course, we only had in this country with the coming of the welfare state when the Labour government was in power, and that would be in 1948. So she was a very far-seeing person when it came to the problems that confronted society in general. What's the most significant thing she's done in terms of history? I thought quite hard about this, and I would say at the end of the day, the very important thing about her, all her activities was that she was a leading figure in a campaign that began with what was called, I'm trying to think of what it was called now, it was called the Colour Bar in those days. Now the interesting thing about her employing people to work on her newspaper was that one of her reporters was actually an Afro, he was an Afro-American called Claude Mackay. And she sent him out to interview various people in all sorts of events. And after one particular event, what she, what was published in her paper, she didn't, she wasn't available at the time. She got someone else to look after the paper for her. But in fact, she was arrested under what was called the Defence of the Realm Act because whatever he wrote in this article was regarded as seditious. So in fact, she was taken to court and imprisoned for six months, but her presses just kept rolling and she was not defeated. In terms of wider history, no doubt in my mind that in challenging racism, she was the first figure of any, of any that was known, would, would be known because of the great work that she did with the suffragettes that, that would be taken mo notice of. And in fact, it was at a time when the anti-colonial movement was growing. And this, she could see that the color bar operated against black people. And she felt that it was part of, an, of the imperial white man setting, setting affairs of the world in, in the, with their particular agenda. And she wanted to criticize this. And that's just what she did. When she went to Ethiopia, she established a movement called the Social Services Society and she also funded, because she raised the funds for it, the first hospital in Ethiopia. So remembrance of her everywhere are inspirational and, and, this, and, and so it's her name that's going forward in so many ways, especially today.